Well, we're going to explore some prophetic passages that are often overlooked in many Bible studies. That's why we call it the next Holocaust. Yes, there is another Holocaust coming. And the refuge in Edom. This is not often talked about in many prophecy books and so forth. And of course, right now, we're getting all kinds of questions. Israel, of course, is fighting for its existence, as it always has for the last many decades. But uh, this particular time it would appear to be very easily escalating to something far major. And we're getting all kinds of questions. Is this Armageddon in its beginning? Newt Gingrich calls it World War III. Indeed, it may be. And uh, how does it fit into the prophetic passages? And that's what we're going to try to explore a little bit. We might remind ourselves of a basic passage in Zechariah 12, which is really at the center line of all of these things. Zechariah wrote 2,500 years ago, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Boy, there's a mouthful. What an incredible accolade to, to, to uh, tie on our, our Father. He stretches forth the heavens. He lays the foundations of the earth. Astonishing how few people in our country still acknowledge that. And formeth the spirit of man within him. He continues, verse 2, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling, or precisely a goblet of staggering, unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And that, of course, characterizes today in broad strokes in any way. But let's go on. It says, In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be torn in pieces, cut in pieces or torn in pieces, though all the people of the earth <clears throat> be gathered together against it. What's remarkable about this passage is that it highlights that the entire world is going to be arrayed against the city. And uh, at the moment, it would appear the United States is getting pretty lonely in terms of its support of Israel. Um, one could argue that in the final analysis, we too may be less than faithful in this pursuit. All the people of the earth be gathered together against it. All people. And that's what we're experiencing right now as we record this Bible study. The headlines are continuing as virtually the entire world is faced with having to deal with the city of Jerusalem. And for most, it's obviously more than just burdensome. All the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So what we want to talk about, we're not going to focus just on Jerusalem today. I thought that's a good place to start. We want to focus on some of their enemies. And clearly, there's Russia. Clearly, there's Iran, Syria, and others. But we're going to discover there are some enemies in the Bible that may not be as visible to us today as... Uh, these major enemies are. There's a place called Jordan. We want to understand because it's a strange exception on the planet Earth in terms of its eluding, I should say eluding, the uh, reign of the Antichrist. Moab, Eman, and Ammon are three tribes that the Bible has much to say about all the way through that today we would summarize as calling it Jordan. And the Amalekites are also subsumed in this group. We're going to take a look at each one of those. And then we're going to focus on the tribulation. Much talked about, widely misunderstood by many Bible students. What's its role? What's its purposes? One of the burning questions among many of our study groups is, gee, does the church go through the tribulation? It's our view, doesn't mean we're right, but it's our view, that that begs two understandings. What is the church and what is the tribulation? The more you know about each, it would appear that they are mutually exclusive. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But we're going to focus on the Armageddon campaign. Is Armageddon on the threshold? Or is, are these, this escalation that is threatened by the current hostilities, could that be the beginning of Armageddon or no? If so, if so, why or why not? And, of course, we'll touch upon a related topic that some believe are the, is included in that, Others believe is distinct, and that's the Magog invasion. 
So that's our agenda for this session. In terms of current events, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about Syria. So Iran has given Syria some Sahab 3 missiles on the mountains overlooking uh, Israel, and they're now surrounded by Russian-made missile defenses, which some people believe are better than the Patriot. So Syria is right in the middle of this. Is it possible that this may result in the fulfillment of Isaiah 17? Speculation. The Magog invasion. Is it possible that Russia's moving its Black Sea fleet into the Mediterranean and establishing a major naval base in Syria on the coast there at Tartus? Is this positioning for the Magog invasion? Could it be right around the corner? And how does all this fit with the fabled 70th week of Daniel, which of course is the pivotal issue around, all, uh, around which all these other things hang? Four disciples came to Jesus for a confidential briefing, and he pointed them to those four verses. The last four verses of Daniel 9 is the key to end-time prophecy. How does that fit in here? And then, of course, the middle of that week is an event that triggers the Great Tribulation. And we'll talk about that. And that, of course, the climax of that 70th week is Armageddon. But where does this treaty of Jor with Jordan fit in? And we'll take a look at that. And uh, this attack on Syria... I know of no competent studies I've seen that give us any perspective as to when Isaiah 17 will be fulfilled. The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Is that part of Armageddon? Is it something sooner? Is it something detached? We don't know. But it is something that's watched because Damascus is the oldest continually inhabited city on the planet Earth. And it would seem from a Bible prophecy point of view, it has a destiny of being destroyed. Is that going to be a nuke? Israel has threatened that on several occasions. And if they're pushed hard enough, they may make this fulfillment come true. We'll watch and see. But there's another passage that catches our attention, and that's in Daniel chapter 11, verse 41. In Daniel chapter 11, up to about verse 35 is historical. From verse, about verse uh, 40 on, it is clearly speaking of the Antichrist. Verses 36 through 39 are an overlap. They were both historical, but they also echo uh, a foreshadowing of this coming world leader. In any case, by the time you get to 40 and following, clearly the tone of the passage is dealing with the person that we commonly call the Antichrist. That's a tragic label for a lot of reasons, but... It's stuck in the literature, so we'll stay with it. But it says that he, the Antichrist, shall enter into the glorious land, a term we assume refers to Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand. That's interesting. Even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So these three groups, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, for some reason managed to escape his thumb, if you will. We don't know why or how, but it does give us this strange, rather provocative clue that there's something special going on here. It's our conjecture that you'll see unfold here that one of the reasons they escape is to provide a refuge, a place to run, if you will, for the remnant that's going to be fleeing Jerusalem in accordance with Christ's instructions. But that's a speculation on our part. We're going to explore what is the purpose of the Great Tribulation. We use that term a lot. What is its purpose? What is, what's to be accomplished in the Great Tribulation? And, of course, the prophetic role of Ammon, Moab, and Edom, which, which is a region today we know as Jordan. And Matthew 24, verse 15, talks about the abomination of desolation, which is a trigger in which his, uh, Jesus' followers are to flee Jerusalem. In fact, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Great. Which mountains? It's surprising to discover that those mountains are specified in the Word of God. That gives rise to another issue that causes a lot of confusion. Just where does Jesus return to the planet Earth? Many of us are fond of quoting Zechariah 14.4, where he shall, his feet shall stand on that day at Mount of Olives and so on. And yet that may not be his first return. He may have an errand to run before he reaches the Mount of Olives. 
Because there's very, this very interesting passage in Isaiah 63 that implies that he first returns to Edom to fight a battle himself. In fact, when you read Isaiah 63, it says, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I speak, that, uh, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Who could that be? That's God himself. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth the wine fat? He answers, he says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. Wow, what's going on there? The day of vengeance is in his heart. And that's going to fulfill part two of the mandate that he read in, when he opened his ministry in the synagogue of Nazareth. So we're going to look at Jordan, Moab, Edom, Ammon, and the Amalekites, and then take a look at what the implications of all that are upon our two main topics, the Tribulation and Armageddon Campaign. And we're going to finish talking about some controversies about the Magog invasion to get that in focus. So let's talk about Jordan. The Hashemite kingdom of Jordan is not an ancient kingdom. It is actually a European creation of 1946, after World War II, by the stroke of a pen by an old friend of ours by the name of Winston Churchill. He got a lot of things right. This may have been a big mistake. So it's interesting that the League of Nations had given Britain a mandate to provide a homeland for Israel. But what they ended up doing is peeling off 75% of that land grant to create a Palestinian state. You want a, state, a Palestinian state? It was created in 1946 by the British Foreign Office. It was called Transjordan. And uh, that's the region which happens to embrace the regions that are known biblically as Edom, Moab, and Ammon. So... Prior to World War I, the areas of Ammon, Moab, and Edom had previously been populated by unaffiliated Bedouin tribes, just uh, uh, mobile, um, transient tribes. Of course, during the war, British and the Allies, of course, were fighting the Germans and the Ottoman Turks. There was a young major by the name of T.E. Lawrence that organized what is popularly publicized as the Arab Revolt. Very colorful. It was fanned by the media in Britain. How really successful it is a subject of great scholastic controversy. But in any case, it, is, it was a major event of the time. And uh, General Allenby was ultimately victorious in the Middle East, obviously. So the League of Nations awarded the British a mandate on April 25th of 1920, which was to endure until May 14th of 48, when the State of Israel was formed. And uh, so in, in uh, the next following year, an aggressive young man named Abdullah, he was the son of Sharif Hassan of Mecca in Arabia, he moved into the land east of Jordan with his troops. And uh, so the British colonial secretary, uh, namely Winston Churchill at the time, recognized Abdullah as the Emir of Transjordan. That was just a stroke of the pen of the Foreign Office. Abdullah then consolidated control within his so-called Arab Legion. In 1946, after the war, Abdullah was crowned as King of Transjordan. And of course, since then, his great-grandson is now the current King in Jordan. And uh, in 1948, Jordan, however, joined the attack against Israel's War of Independence successfully fought the Haganah and held the so-called West Bank of the Jordan. And uh, in 67, there again, they joined Egypt in the Six-Day the six War, and they lost it. And uh, in 1998, having previously repudiated any rights to the West Bank, Jordan signed a peace treaty with Israel at Camp David. This has endured, interestingly enough. A lot of other treaties have come and gone. But it's interesting that they repudiated their rights, signed the treaty, and uh, that still operates today. 
and would seem to set the stage for Daniel 11:41, that these the shall escape out of his hand. When the Antichrist takes over, um, Edom, Moab, and, and Ammon seem to, uh, what we call the region of Jordan, for some reason, seems to be exempted. And so uh, it's our conjecture that this may be a, uh, to create a refuge for the remnant that are going to flee from Jerusalem uh, during the attack and during the Great Tribulation. And there's lots of references. We won't try to go through them all. We'll go through some of them here. But Isaiah 16 and Micah 2 are major ones you may want to jot down to look at at your religion. And let's get at uh, Moab and, and uh, Edom and Ammon. This all starts, in a sense, back in Genesis 19. That's the chapter where Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. And uh, Lot gets, uh, is in a town called Zor. He went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountain, and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zor, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve the seed of our father. They made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. Then he perceived, and he perceived not when she lay down or when she arose. It came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday night with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also. And go thou in and lie with him that we may preserve the seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down or when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son, called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And when the younger, she also bare a son, called his name ben -Ami. And the same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. So this incestuous beginning is what starts the history of the Moabites and the Ammonites. And so... They're regarded as relatives of the Israelites. And in Deuteronomy 2, it commands them to treat them kindly, despite those origins. At the time of the Exodus, Israel did not conquer Ammon. And that's not only Deuteronomy 2, but it's in Judges 11 and following. However, the Ammonites were condemned for joining the Moabites and hiring Balaam were forbidden to enter the congregation of Israel to the tenth generation. That's in Deuteronomy 23. And uh, Rabbah Ammon is now Ammon, the capital of Jordan. That town is named after the Ammonites. So much for them. Let's get to Moab. We're going to have a lot to say about Moab. He obviously was a son by the union with the eldest daughter. We see him first mentioned really in Genesis 14. So uh, the, the four kings from the east invaded Moab and overthrew the people of that region. And uh, Moab, like, uh, like the others, were a highly organized kingdom. Good pursuits. They were in very relatively fertile ground. They had splendid buildings, distinctive pot pottery, strong fortifications. And uh, so they have an have organized history. They overflowed their main plateau and occupied areas north of Arnon. That's the boundary, typically, of Moab and destroying the former inhabitants. And so they shared these lands with the Ammonites, so they're closely related, the two of them. And just part of the Exodus, these lands in Arnon were wrested from Moab by Sihon, the king of the Amorites. That's going to be another enemy of Israel. And a very key event occurs in Judges 11, when Israel sought permission to travel along the king's highway, which crossed that pl plateau. And uh, Moab refused. And uh, that is... In spite of that, which is a major burden for Israel, Moses was forbidden to attack Moab despite their unfriendliness. And uh, although the Moabites from that time on were to be excluded from Israel, and that's all in, uh, covered in the books of Moses and following. There's a very key event that takes place when Balak, the king of Moab, is distressed because he can't beat, he can't beat the Israelis. So he hires a prophet from Mesopotamia, very interesting character by the name of Balaam. He hires him to, to curse Israel. And uh, Balaam can't do that. He's perfectly willing to take money for being a prophet, <laughs> but he can't curse what God has blessed. But what Balaam does do 
he counsels Balak on how to defeat Israel because Israel's uh, being supported by God and if Israel turns from worshiping God, then, uh, God then they'll have success against it. And they get Israel to do that by having the best looking girls camp along the fringes of the Israeli camp and start getting them involved and then started getting them into idol worship and that's the strategy. The, uh, the, the seduction of Israel by the Midianite and Moabite women is a major discussion in Numbers 22 through 25 and so on. And it's re referred to in the book of Revelation and elsewhere. We, as we go through the days of Judges, Eklon the king of Moab invaded the, uh, the Israelite lands as far as Jericho, oppressed them for 18 years as one of the, the six servitudes in the book of Judges. Ehud the Benjamite assassinates him. The whole book of Judges is, of course, the, the uh, rather depressing account of failing to follow through on the successes of the, of the book of Joshua. But one of the bright spots, so to speak, in the, book, in the time of the Judges is when a guy by the name of Elimelech and his wife Naomi migrate to Moab because of a famine in Bethlehem. And uh, their two sons marry two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. The husband dies, the, the two son, the sons also die. That leaves Naomi with two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. And both of them elect, want to stay with her. She finally talks one of them out of it. Can't talk Ruth out of it. Because uh, 10 years go by and things are better in Bethlehem, so Naomi's going to go back to Bethlehem Ruth insists upon going with her. And that whole saga in a little four-chapter book called the Book of Ruth is an elegant love story. It's also essential background if you're going to understand the Book of Revelation. In any case, Ruth ends up marrying a, a wealthy landowner by the name of Boaz, who is the kinsman redeemer, and ends up on the, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It's that event that links Bethlehem to the, the house of David. And uh, so that's an essential piece of background. As we move on through the days of Saul, he, he warred with the Moabites. But David lodged his parents in Moab while he was a fugitive from Saul. So a very interesting relationship between David and the Moabites. He later will subdue Moab, Moab and uh, uh, yet also set apart many of the Moabites for death. After Solomon's death, Moab broke free but was subdued by Omri of Israel. There's a long history of back and forth. And toward the close of Ahab's life, Moab began to break free again. And Jehoram of Israel sought the help of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and the king of Edom to, re, uh, to regain Moab. But the campaign was abortive. Later, Jehoshaphat's own land was invaded by a confederacy of Moabites, Ammonites, and Edomites, but confusion broke out. And the allies attacked one another. So again and again, we see an inability of Israel's enemies to get their own act together, which, is to, 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 which was salutary for Israel's point of view. And uh, in the year of Elisha's death, bands of Moabites again raided Israel. During the latter part of the 8th century BC, Moab was subdued by Assyria and compelled to pay tribute. But after Assyria fell, Moab was free again. They entered Judah in the days of Jehoiakim. And uh, after the fall of Jerusalem under Nebuchadnezzar, some Jews found refuge in Moab but returned to Gedalia when Gedalia became the governor later. Moab is finally subdued by Nebuchadnezzar and it fell successfully under the control of the Persians and various Arab groups. They ceased to have an independent existence as a nation after the exile, but they are known as a race and referred to as such in Nehemiah and elsewhere. And uh, this brings you up to rough, roughly, relatively uh, current biblical New Testament periods. And uh, Moab and the prophets are often mentioned and divine judgment is often pronounced on them. Moabi the Moabites and the Edomites especially are always on the side of Israel's enemies. We need to understand that. The archaeological story of Moab is slowly being unraveled. It's rather slow in, in, the, in the Jordan area. However, back in 1868, the Moabite stone was found, which helped uh, open up the language in the ninth century history. It's now in the Louvre in Paris. And there's a number of sites that are starting to give us insights into the early Moabite history. But let's shift now. We're going to talk about Edom. Let's talk where that all started. It was in Genesis 25. Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children, a plurality here, and the children struggled together within her. She said, if it be so, why am I thus? She went to inquire of the Lord. 
she could tell something was going on that was unusual. The Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Harry, <laughs> or Esau. And the word means robust, but in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, outside hunting sense. And uh, anyway, his name is Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob, or heel catcher, or Yaakov, heel catcher. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. The rabbis make a big thing of this, that the war started in the womb. And... And, and uh, Jacob had Esau's heel. He, Esau was trying to get away from Jacob back then. And it gets worse as we go. The boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. So we get the impression here that Yaakov was a mo mother's boy. But uh, Esau was the... Man's man, the outside hunter, and obviously uh, had endeared his father as a result. And this course leads from, from here, the book of Genesis goes on to the most famous food transaction in the history, the porridge and so forth. Where, but the descendants of Abraham, of course, he has uh, three women. From Sarah, of course, we have Isaac. From Hagar, we have Ishmael. And uh, from Keturah, we have a handful of tribes. Uh, and uh, from Jokshan, we have Sheba and Dedan, which we normally associate with Saudi Arabia. From Midian, we have a whole series of, of tribes uh, that are typically uh, roots of the Bedouins, the Bedouins. And so if you're talking Arabs in a geographical sense, then you're talking uh, Sheba, Dedan, and the uh, five from Midian, the Midianites. But it's not that simple, because... Ishmael has 12 sons, just as Isaac, you know, Jacob will have 12 sons, Ishmael does also. But uh, Isaac ends up having two sons here, obviously, Esau and Jacob. Jacob is, in his way, faithful. Esau is upset for lots of reasons, and he deliberately turns his back on his heritage, and he deliberately marries multiple wives among the Ishmaelites. And the tribes did not keep themselves distinct. So the interesting thing here is that um, whether you call Israel's enemies today Edomites or Esau-derived uh, or Ishmael-derived, they all tra tra uh, trace back to the same tribal background, if you will. The press uses the term broadly as Arabs, but it's an unfortunate label because it has some other ambiguities. The Persians are not Arabs, and the Hamites are not Arabs. That means that Yasser Arafat was an Egyptian, a Hamite, not an Arab, not even a Shemite. So we, the point is, it, it, there's a lot of confusion, whether you're speaking geographically or speaking ethnically. And uh, most people that speak to this speak illiterately, without any real understanding of the background. But anyway, the term Edom denotes either the name of Esau, given in memory of the Red Porridge incident of Genesis 25, or exchange for his birthright. It's also a term that refers to the Edomites collectively as a nation, if you will. And uh, it also speaks of the land occupied by Esau's de descendants, also called Mount Seir, the land of Seir. And um, now, modern archaeology has shown there were t tribes in there before his time that they apparently conquered them and so forth. There's also gaps. There are issues here. It doesn't concern us directly, really. But Esau had already occupied Edom when Jacob returned from Haran. And he had tribal chiefs. The King James Version uses the term dukes, but they actually had uh, 11 of these. I thought there were 12, but anyway. Um, Edomites had kings before any king reigned over the Israelites, according to Genesis 36. The wilderness of Edom is an area that we want to understand. I'll show you on a map rather than go through the boundaries here, a very rugged mountainous area. It's known as the wilderness of Edom. And uh, it's not a fertile land, but there are some cultivatable areas. 
But that, when you don't have cultivatable land, you end up having a militaristic tradition. And here's, here's a rough feeling of the land of Canaan, if you will. But uh, Moab, just being just east of the Dead Sea, essentially. Edom to the south of Moab. And Midian, south of Edom. And the Midianites and so forth. And uh, when they left the Exodus, they, get, they end up at Jabal al Laws, which we believe is the real Mount Sinai in contrast to traditions. But they find their way to Kadesh Barnea, don't make it. Edom will not let them cross, so they have to go a long way around, and that leads to a, the tensions that continue all through the biblical times. Because the, the King's Highway passed right along that eastern plateau. The major towns included Selah, Petra, Basra, and Teman. The word Basra means sheepfold, and that term can be applied to several areas that have a natural sheepfold um, topography. We'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, so at the time of the Exodus, of course, they sought permission to travel the King's Highway, but it was, the, the request was refused. And uh, despite this burdensome decision on the part of Edomite, Israel was forbidden to abhor their Edomite brother, Deuteronomy 23. But the Edomites don't finish there. Whenever you find, when the, later on, when Nebuchadnezzar is attacking the city of Jerusalem, the people on the sidelines cheering the Babylonians were the Edomites. Now, not a very good way for relatives to act, is it? And that's in, in Numbers 24 is when Balaam predicted the conquest of Edom. Balaam predicts about a lot of interesting things, the conquest of Edom being among them. And uh, so... And Joshua allocated territory of Judah up to the borders of Edom, but did not encroach on their lands. Two centuries later, King Saul was fighting the Edomites, and some of them were in his service. We find it in the scripture. David conquered Edom and put garrisons throughout the land. So they, it becomes a, a vassal area for Israel in the peak, in the peak period. A lot of slaughter of Edomites at that time. In fact, Joab, David's commander, um, Spent six months in there getting rid of all the male population. Some obviously escaped because uh, a royal prince fled to Egypt and later became a trouble to Solomon and years later. So the Edomites and the Israelites have been at odds from the very beginning. David's kingdom proper is, is shown here on the map. The vassal states end up including um, the Philistines and Ammon and Hamath way up to the north. And the Arameans, Moab, and Edom acknowledge the sovereignty and pay, pay tribute. So that was the peak, if you will, of David's kingdom, which went w obviously well east of the, uh, the uh, Jordan River, which is the river connecting uh, you know, the Galilee and, and uh, the Dead Sea. So there's as, mu there's as much territory east as there was uh, west. The conquest of Edom enabled Solomon to build a port at Ezion Geber and uh, their copper mines, and that's, that's where a lot of the commercial prosperity occurs in the days of Solomon. As you get into subsequent kings, there's constant raids on one or the other. We won't go through each one of these, but they, uh, they, there's a constant warfare between Edom and Israel. And uh, so, don't need to go through each one of these. I think that's going to be tangential to our uh, purpose. Um, We finally get to the, the, the time when uh, Assyria is uh, on the rise and they uh, take over the Edomites, among other things. And after the fall of, uh, uh, of uh, Judah, of course, Edom rejoices. Psalm 37 is descriptive of the, the, the Edomites. The, the Edomites cheered the fall of J Judah the same way the Muslims cheered the twin, twin Towers coming down. And it became a cause for celebration. The prophets are full of judgments on Edom for their bitter hatred of Israel. Jeremiah 49, a good portion of the book of Lamentations. Ezekiel 25 and 35. Joel 3, especially. Amos 9. In fact, uh, James will quote from Amos when we get to the Acts 15 event, which I'll come to. The entire book of Obadiah is a judgment on Edom. And uh, so 
We'll look at some of that shortly. And uh, anyway, they fell into Arab hands about the 5th century to the 3rd century, overrun by the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans are the ones that built the so-called treasury at Petra, which we're going to look at shortly. And uh, through these centuries, yet other Edomites fled to Judah, so there's a lot of intermixing here. Judas Maccabeus, uh, one of the five sons of Mattathias, uh, who uh, responsible for the, 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 the uh, Maccabean revolt. He subdues them, and they were later compelled to be circumcised and incorporated in the Jewish people. And now the key point to get a perspective here is when the Romans conquered Judea, they deliberately appointed Herod, who was an Edomite, Idiomaean is the, another equivalent term, uh, as their vassal. So Herod, the Romans picked an, a known historical enemy of Israel, to be in charge, and uh, and despite his uh, you know elaborate building plans and other attempts to make himself popular, it didn't fly because he was an Edomite and not a, he was he's non-Jewish, and in fact you could say anti-Jewish. There's another group that gets mixed up here from time to time as you read your Bible. The Amalekites. He's the son of Eliphaz. He's a grandson of Esau, so in that sense he's an Edomite, but his name is a collective noun for his descendants, the Amalekites. And we first find them at the Rephidim, the wilderness of Sinai, in Exodus 17, in, in Deuteronomy 25. And uh, because of this attack, they came under permanent ban and were to be destroyed. So they're, they're, that's pretty ag there's aggressive language against the Amalekites all the way through. You may recall that's the famous battle where Moses had to hold his to hold when he held his hands up, they were winning. When his hands went down, they lost. So Aaron and Hur both stood on each side and held up his hands, um, the way that Mark Bright and Dan hold my hands up sometimes, I suppose. But the, uh, the whole idea of support. But that famous event there caused them to succeed. But the Malachites are defeated a number of times. It's very interesting that there are a total of ten tribes that face Israel in the Promised Land. Three are defeated before Joshua takes over in the days of Moses. That left seven. I think that's interesting that there's three and seven, the same thing as the Antichrist has. He's facing ten kings, and um, three are put down, and seven survive. And the patterning there, there might be something to study there. But uh, from the days of the judges, two major encounters. The Malachites assisted Eglon, the king of Moab, in attacking the Israelite territory. And later forces uh, raid Israeli crops, and Gideon drove them out. But uh, from Exodus onward, the Malachites are to be found in the Negev, but for a time they gained a foothold in Ephraim, that's the northern part of Israel. But you generally associate them with the south, Negev being in the south. And um, Baal looked away to their lands from his vantage point in Moab and described them as the first of the nations, which may be in regard to their origin or to their status. Interesting phrase. And Samuel commanded Saul to destroy the Malachites in the south of Tel Aim. That's one of the, that's one of the uh, cities that we're going to be interested in in the uh, the region of Edom. And uh, Saul pursues him, captures the king alive, and Samuel slew Agag. And very interesting thing, so, uh, Samuel told Saul not to take any booty, but Saul failed to do that. He didn't kill Agag, he took, he took booty, and for that reason, Saul ends his, he, he, has, he has the uh, crown taken away from him. But it's interesting that he was to kill Agag and didn't, because he didn't there's a descendant of Agag that becomes prominent later, a guy by the name of Haman in the book of Esther. And uh, David fought, fought the Amalekites in the area of Ziklag. And uh, so they, uh, they're, they're back and forth all the, way through the, all the way through the king's period. Haman, of course, is the villain of the book of Esther who plots the massacre of all the Jews. But it's interesting, uh, the rivalry between him and Mordecai, of course, is the whole drama in the book of Esther. And your book of Esther typically you, would record that Haman was eventually hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. One of the problems with that is it wasn't a gallows, it was a crucifixion. That's a mistranslation, but it's commonly held, it's now in our, in our literary vocabulary. Uh, he was impaled, and uh, the Persians invented crucifixion, the Romans widely adapted it. But what's interesting here is Haman is a descendant of a king that Saul was supposed to kill and didn't. It's interesting, there was a Shimei that was cursing David, and they, his, his men wanted him to, to kill him, and David said no. He spared Shimei. 
From Shimei, we get Mordecai. So the whole drama in the book of Esther derives from that um, the descendants, if you will. So anyway, so much of that. Um, if we had the time, we'd go through each one of these major uh, predictions of the, the end time results. Um, Obadiah we'll take a look at briefly. Um, Isaiah 34 is part of a four-chapter section of Isaiah that's called the Little Apocalypse. And uh, Malachi and Ezekiel also have much to say about it. You might jot those down, check them out at your own leisure. Um, and the whole region, of course, is desolate since the Babylonian captivity. Let's take a look at Obadiah. Not the whole book. Uh, it's a little book, but just a couple of verses. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God, concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord. That's interesting. An ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. How descriptive. We're going to see very vivid pictures of that when we take a look at Petra here in a minute. Whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Skipping on to verse 8. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom? And understanding out of the Mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau shall be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. And incidentally, the word shame is Hamas. That's kind of interesting. Okay. Let's step back. We've, we, having, having summarized superficially the, the, the occurrence of these tribes in, throughout the Bible, let's stand back and try to get the whole thing in focus. Matthew, at the end of chapter 23 of Matthew, summarizes God's primary theme. He summarizes the purpose of all history, the tragedy of all history, and yet the triumph of all history. In just a couple of verses, 37, 38, and 39 of Matthew 23. Matthew 20, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings? That's the purpose of all history, for God's chosen to be gathered together. The tragedy of all history, but ye would not. And ye would not. When the Messiah finally does come, announced in the Garden of Eden, orchestrated all through the Old Testament, when he shows up, they wouldn't receive him. That's the tragedy of all history. And because of that, Jesus announces in Matthew verse 38, 20, uh, 23 verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And indeed it has been up until recent times. But the triumph of all history is then summarized Jesus says, But I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And from this, you really need to take a study of the book of Matthew and recognize that the rejection of Christ occurred in Matthew chapter 12. From chapter 13 on, Jesus no longer, he changes his whole ministry style. He doesn't speak in parable. He, does, he speaks only in public he, he speaks only in parables. And uh, uh, you, understand, you need to understand that watershed. That's when the rejection uh, occurred and, of course, gets confirmed when they crucify him. But he says, You shall not see me henceforth until ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. There is an event that's going to change that, that they have to come to terms with. And that's the purpose of the tribulation, is to drive them to the wall to bring forth that very event. So you shall say. In Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, very, very interesting summary verse where God says, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face, and in their affliction they shall seek me earnestly. Now, for God to have to, to go and return, he must have left his place. There's, of course, obviously an allusion to the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's, he's in fact, in Hosea, in the Old Testament, he says, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. 
that's singular and specific and seek my face. That's going to be a subject of Leviticus 26 that we'll look at in the next session. We'll take a quick snapshot of a pivotal briefing by the Lord in Matthew 24. Because four disciples come to him and says, how shall we know the end times? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you. It's interesting that he opens and closes this presentation by telling us to guard ourselves against deception. Take heed that no man deceive you. For men shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, or the beginning of birth pains. I want you to notice this group of signs that are clustered here in these few verses. Because Matthew's going to deal with what happens after these signs. Luke focuses on what's going to happen before these same list of signs that he, he, he alludes to them. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, in divers places. So we find this list of events in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 9. We find it in Luke 21, verses 4 through 24. And we also find it in Revelation, in the first dozen verses of chapter 6, that same clustering. But there's a very, very key verse. And Matthew continues, Then shall ye deliver, in other words, after that group of signs, shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the agapeo, the agape of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And here we have the key pivotal verse. It's verse 15 in Matthew 24. Verse 14 in the parallel account by Mark, and 13, they're almost the same all the way through. Jesus says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Very, very key verse. It deals with a technical term called the abomination of desolation, widely misunderstood but, but clearly identifiable. Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, so Jesus himself authenticates Daniel for us, that he was the prophet. We don't have to worry about who wrote Daniel and all of that business. Jesus lays it right out. And, and he alludes to an event that occurs in Daniel 8, 9, 11, and 12, the abomination of desolation. Stand in the holy place, in the holy of holies. And then he adds a phrase, Whoso readeth, let him understand. How many of you read that with me just now? Played a dirty trick on you. Because now you have an obligation to understand that passage. You need to get behind this do your homework and understand what Jesus is talking about here. Let's get the chronology kind of clear. Here's a timeline. Daniel wrote, let's call it, during the 5th century B.C. The return to Jerusalem occurred near the end of that century. The abomination of desolation occurred historically in the 2nd century B.C. under Antiochus Epiphanes. The Septuagint records all this. In other words, the entire Old Testament is translated into Greek in the 3rd century before Christ. The Olivet Discourse that Jesus is quoting is here in the 1st century A.D. But he's alluding to the abomination of desolation as yet future. We know a lot about it because it happened in the past, but that's not what Jesus is indicating. It's going to happen again. That's why understanding that event in the 2nd century is so important. Because without it, we really won't understand, we won't know how to recognize it when it happens again. So that the abomination of desolation, it occurred historically in very clear terms. The word abomination is idol worship. The one that makes the desolate is the extreme, the most insulting version of that. And that's erecting an idol in the holy, most holy spot on the planet Earth, in the temple, in fact, in the Holy of Holies. And it did occur historically. Much is said about it in the scripture and elsewhere. And we can expect it to happen again. And Paul talks a lot about it. Once you realize what he's talking about, 2 Thessalonians 2 details it for us. Going another timeline, understand the, the, the church period, which started chapter 2 in the book of Acts. 
and that goes until the rapture is called the church. It's also a term that Paul uses, calls it the fullness of the Gentiles. Followed by that will be the tribulation. The times of the Gentiles is an all-inclusive term from the time of Nebuchadnezzar. It's the t Neb times of Gentiles is the period of Gentile dominion on the planet Earth. Start with Nebuchadnezzar and it'll continue until the days of the Antichrist are complete. So don't confuse times and fullness between those are different. At the end of the tribulation, of course, we have the Arm Armageddon, the kingdom set up and so forth. So this final week called the 70th week of Daniel, it's a it's the 70th of a, a, spe a specified series of six, 70 weeks, 69 of which are fulfilled. There's a gap. We're now in the 70th week. And it's important that you understand that I won't take the time to build the whole case here. But if you haven't had a chance to study 70th week, make that a high priority if in your prophetic studies. You need to master that. that that's a, a week of years, and it's divided in two halves, three and a half years each. In Daniel chapter... 9, Gabriel gives Daniel a four-verse prophecy. Verse 25, 26, and 27 are the last two. Verse 24 is the scope of the whole thing. Verse 25 covers a period of time. Um, Daniel is a slave in Babylon. There's, he knows from reading Jeremiah that that period of captivity is almost over. Gabriel interrupts his prayer and comes and tells him that from the decree to rebuild the city of Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid will be 69 weeks of years. 7 plus 62 weeks. Then there's an interval because there are things that occur in verse 26 that are after verse 25 but before verse 27. So there's an interval there which includes the crucifixion and the destruction of Jerusalem. But the main the climax of the whole passage is verse 27 which deals with the final week of years. It's the most documented period of time in the Bible both Old and New Testament. And um, it's, it's defined by a covenant being enforced by a world leader, not a treaty being signed. That's what's often inferred by many. It could be, but the language actually implies that a covenant is enforced somehow. And that apparently has to do with the temple because in the middle of that covenant period, the covenants have violated and they, uh, but, but the world leader puts himself up to be worshipped. That's called the abomination of desolation. The period of time from that abomination of desolation to the end of that seven-year period, is labeled by Jesus Christ himself as the Great Tribulation. He's quoting from Daniel chapter 12 that deals with the same issue. But it's, I want to point out that's a three-and-a-half-year period. This 70th week is called three-and-a-half years, 42 months, 12, 60 days. In either half, there's passages that deal with the front half and the back half. In each case, it's 42 months or 1260 days. So this is not allegorical. It's not symbolic. It's nailed to the calendar, so to speak. The um, Holy Spirit did everything but give us hours and minutes and seconds. Very precise. It's the most documented, most detailed specification in the Scripture. But the important thing to understand, people loosely talk about the seven-year tribulation. That's just, it's loose definitions. The tribulation, labeled by Christ himself, is the last three and a half years. The first half may be a time of un unparalleled peace, a false peace, if you will. But it's not. if you want to speak of the seven years, speak of it as the 70th week of Daniel. That won't be ambiguous. You're talking about the tribulation. You're actually talking about a three-and-a-half-year period, not a seven-year period. Can we get that and move on? Okay. Jesus continues then, when you see the abomination of the desolation, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Not those that are in New York or Paris or London, those that are in Judea. Flee into the mountains. Let him which is in the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. You don't even stop to grab a coat. You get out and get out now. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why not in winter? Because often, not always, but often, Judea is impassable in the winter. It snows. Neither on the Sabbath day, for obvious reasons. That means he's obviously talking to Jews here, not Gentiles. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever, nor, nor ever shall be. When does it start? When the abomination of desolation is established. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for elect's sake those days shall be shortened. And that's a technology statement. That's an allusion in effect to weapons of mass destruction. You can't visualize that being fulfilled with muskets and bayonets. This is a whole different thing. The Great Tribulation. 
He's quoting from Daniel 12. Reading Daniel 12, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Both Michael and Gabriel have job descriptions. Gabriel is always on an errand of enunciating something having to do with the Messiah. Michael is a military warrior. He always is embattling on behalf of Israel. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. There shall be a time of trouble such as... Never was since there was a nation, even at that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. A time of trouble such as never since there was a nation at that time. That includes Nazi Germany. In other words, it's going to be worse. Jeremiah calls it a little different. He says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The focus of the whole scenario is Israel, Yaakov, Jacob. The time of Jacob's trouble is one of the labels equivalent to the period of great tribulation. Now Matthew's, Matthew 24 is a key passage of prophecy in the New Testament. Luke has a passage that's similar but distinctively different. Many people assume it's like the Olivet Discourse. Because they both make reference to the, the wars, famines, earthquakes, and so forth. And they both talk ultimately of a cosmic upheaval at the end. But Matthew talks about the abomination of desolation. After these, this cluster of events, there is an abomination of desolation. And from that point on, he goes on to talk about the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, etc. Luke is a little different. He uses the, when he gets the same cluster of events, he says, Before these signs... A number of things take place, and what he ends up talking about is the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., and he warns his followers to get out of town, which they do. Church hist uh, historians, Eusebius and others, have recorded that because the believers, there was a hiatus in, in the uh, Roman troops because of Vespasian going to Rome to take over the empire, because Nero had died, in, in effect. Titus had about nine months there to wait until he got orders. During that period of time, you could see them camped around, but it hadn't, they hadn't sealed off the city yet. That was the time to get out of town. Jesus warned them. They took the warnings. And according to Eusebius, there were no, Christ, no Hebrew Christians that were killed in the fall of Jerusalem. Over a million and a half of men, women, and children slaughtered in that siege. But no Christians because they followed Christ. And he said, this generation shall not pass away until all be fulfilled. He's not talking the Mount of Olives. He's talking in the temple during the day in this presentation, according to Luke. And because that, uh, it's interesting, that's the same duration of time that Israel wandered in the wilderness for 38 years. Matthew is focusing on something that happens at the end time. When he says this generation shall not pass away, he's talking about a different generation altogether. Interestingly enough, there's two first and last generations there. The seven letter seven churches fit in ahead of those signs, so you can go, through, go from there. In Acts 15... We're familiar with the fact that the big debate was about does a Jew, does a Christian have to be a Jew to be saved? Does he have to keep the law? And uh, Paul and Peter go to Jerusalem to have it out. And they each had their say. But after they had their peace, James answered saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. He resolves his counsel and says, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles and take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as is written. And James quotes from Amos 9 a very interesting passage. He quotes Amos 9 verse 11 which says, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. How interesting it is, is that clearly the, the book of Acts, clearly Paul's letters emphasize that God is not finished with Israel. Israel has a destiny at the end times. Many churches are blind to this because of the peculiar replacement theology position that they have held to. But clearly there is a destiny for Israel and that's really what we're dealing with all the way through this briefing uh, series. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. And it goes on. Acts 15, that famous council of Jerusalem. But it's interesting. See, there were two issues before that council. Most people missed the, missed the second one. The first issue was, does a convert have to become a Jew to be saved? And the answer is no. He doesn't have to keep the law, etc. That was the, basically what they're saying. 
The second issue that's implied here is if he doesn't have to be, what's to become of Israel? And that's what James is dealing with here. Paul also spends three chapters in the book of Romans, chapters 9, 10, 11, hammering that God has not finished with Israel. They have a manifest destiny.